This Zero Now program is brought to you with the support of our founding partners. 300,000 students study abroad each year. While it's an incredible adventure, it's important to be prepared for the unexpected. Join us as we delve into a world of eye-opening statistics and practical safety strategies that every student traveler should have in their toolkit. Hear from former FBI hostage rescue team member Greg Schaefer with Elizabeth Brenner and Roz Thackerdine from the nonprofit Protect Students Abroad in our conversation, Safety Tips While Studying Abroad. We're going to start with a a trailer preview for an upcoming documentary about safely uh, traveling abroad, uh, studying abroad. It's called A a Trip of a Lifetime. And so uh, we're just going to take a couple of minutes and and, and watch this trailer, and then we're going to introduce our our panelists. So let's see if I could actually share my screen properly this time. Come pack with me to study abroad in Spain for one month. It beats reading a textbook, sitting in class, back home any day to be on site. We view study abroad programs not just as an educational opportunity for students, but also as a vital part of America's foreign policy. He wanted a cultural immersion experience unlike anything that he'd ever known. And he didn't come home. Thirty days into the course, he fell from a hiking trail. It was raining, it was dark, and he fell almost 300 feet into the Gorigonga River. I am the most terrified I've ever been in my life. So the parents and the families never knew in advance about some of the crime in foreign locations, some of the dangerous circumstances. What we learned was that John was drugged. You have this false assumption that this is a college or university sponsored program that has all been vetted. But they don't. This is an area known to be dangerous. The professors and the leaders were sunbathing a thousand feet up the beach while my son was drowning. I received a a call from a family friend who worked at the State Department. He let me know that Thomas was Noel's 12th death. They don't have to report incidents because they're not obligated to do them. It'd be like three planes crashed and you went to look to find out and said, oh, we don't keep that data. What? An American student missing in Rome has been found dead. Rescuers now finding the body of 20-year-old Ali Willen. In France, five people were killed and 57 injured in a fire in an apartment building near Paris. And because there was no warning, no smoke detectors, very little equipment in the building itself, my friends and I um, had to jump from the fourth floor of the building. One common thread is the betrayal that families feel of the institutional leadership. They would just call this a tragic accident, as opposed to taking ownership for their own negligence. In my son's case, there was no no phone, no rope. A lifeguard could have been hired for $20. It really killed my whole family's life. Irresponsabilidad en todo el sentido de la palabra. These programs are very big money makers. There's often an economic interest that's very resistant to doing anything different because they see it as a threat to their bottom line. Data means knowledge. Knowledge means accountability. Accountability means change. They don't want to change. We're with Protect Students Abroad. We both had students, uh, our sons, who passed away on study abroad and we're hoping to get some legislation moved through. Once you get industry groups opposing something, it can just be hard to break that ice. We don't ever say shut down study abroad. We always say, make it safer. This time, it was our children. We just don't know whose child it will be next. Okay, wow, that is, that is pretty powerful. Um, So two of our uh, uh, panelists today were were, uh, featured in that, um, in the documentary. And First is Roz Thackerdine. Uh, Roz, um, you're with Protect Students Abroad. Just, uh, wouldn't mind just giving a quick background and, and introduce yourself. Hello, Ara. Thank you um, for the opportunity to share a story. Um, my son Ravi was a junior at Swarthmore College. Um, he was a certified EMT that volunteered the Swarthmore Fire and Protective Service. A week prior to going to his study abroad in the spring of 2012, He interned at New York Presbyterian while Cornell Medical College with a transplant surgeon, uh, Dr. Lisa. Um, A couple of weeks later, he um, 
was on his way to Costa Rica to study through an intermediary college, Duke University, and a third-party program um, called Organization for Tropical Studies in Costa Rica. It was a four-month program. The students and um, the leaders traveled and lived together at the botanical stations. Um, my son was interested in ethno medicine and preventative health, and he was going to study global health and tropical medicine. A couple of days prior to the end of the program and two days before him coming home, the students were surprised with an end of semester celebratory trip to a beach that we now know was uh, the most dangerous beach in Costa Rica, simply because of the six rivers that empty into uh, the small bay um, that caused severe water turbulence and a recurrence. And it was known to the locals not to swim there. It was advertised on the hotel website, which was changed from the itinerary we were given. There was no beach trip on there. And um, the students were just standing in the water. I have a photo of him standing in less, less than knee deep water. Um, one of the survivors said it felt like the earth had fell out from underneath their feet. Um, Ravi was pulled out 300 feet. Um, the survivor tumbled out and a tourist was able to pull her out. Um, my son uh, called for help for just about 45 minutes and fought for his life until he went under. Um, the leaders sunbathed up the beach about a thousand feet. They watched. They had gone with no um, no safety devices, no rope, no phones, and a lifeguard they could have hired for 20 US dollars and they neglected to do that. Um, Duke University and Organization for Tropical Studies was totally irresponsible in their decision-making and changing the itinerary um, the way they did without letting us know. Um, in the aftermath, I had a, a lot of questions that wasn't getting answered. I thought Ravi was study abroad's first death because I hadn't seen any news about it. And we had done a lot of research and we thought we made informed educational decision. Um, about a month after um, the Swarthmore president, I had a meeting with her and she said to me, I don't understand how they took the students, how they made this decision to take the students to a beach that was so dangerous, the most dangerous beach. I came home and I Googled study abroad student death, not knowing what I was going to find or what I was going to do with the information. And I went through every link on every page. I ended up at 85 Google pages of links that I would cut and paste and send to myself. One of those parents I found was Elizabeth because Thomas had passed the year before. And we reached out through the internet. I found Elizabeth and we finally met in 2013 and um, eventually turned the data that I collected into an informal database and our work started. It's been over a decade now that we've been doing um, Protect Students Abroad and asking the industry to be partners with us um, to look at this information and make better decisions when it comes to study abroad. And we're hoping we do we do that here, Roz. At least you Thank know, you. In, in, in our in our little way, and, and hopefully get this word out to every single student that is considering studying abroad or is studying abroad, and their and their parents. Um, so we appreciate you being here. Uh, Elizabeth Brenner is also with uh, co-founder of Protect Students Abroad. And Elizabeth, would you mind just introducing yourself and provide your background? Sure. Um, like Roz, my son passed away on study abroad, different country, different cause of death. And um, I found out in the aftermath about the school safety record, things that we hadn't known before. Um, my professional background actually is as a nurse practitioner. So when I came through undergrad and graduate school, it was it was a program that was very heavily steeped in science. And so where in the aftermath, Ross spent a lot of time looking for 
fatalities and injuries of students. I was looking for academics who could explain where the data was. And it, it took a while to understand there really is no transparent safety data. Uh, and so Ross and I, once I saw what she had collected, we've been working together ever since as Protect Students ab Abroad with that simple goal, better evidence-based information. Exactly. And and we've been saying this uh, in, in prior chats is that, you know, you don't know what you don't know. And hopefully we can we can impart some some knowledge and perspective. We're hoping that uh, Greg Schaefer uh, from uh, Schaefer Security Group, also uh, former uh, FBI hostage rescue team member, uh, can provide some insights. Greg, would you mind just giving us a, a brief background and introduce yourself? Are we having a hard time hearing? Okay, Greg, yeah, your audio is not coming through for some reason. Um, so when we, we have a database at this point of 300 study abroad student deaths, it spans back to the 80s at this point. Um, with those 300 deaths, when we look at the numbers, we see unintentional, what we call unintentional injury deaths as the leading cause of death. What do we mean by unintentional injury deaths? Um, of in that category, the three most common causes are motor vehicle crashes, drowning, and uh, interestingly, fatal falls. Um, once we knew that, it, it was really apparent looking at the database that there were things that could be done to better understand the patterns that come together to create those events and then suggest solutions to programs as far as better safety. Greg, is your audio working, huh? Oh, boy, that is that is odd. I don't know uh, what the uh, situation is. Uh, Roz, uh, from, your, from your experience, I mean, so what, what would you say the, the leading causes of death for students uh, studying abroad, you know, based on the research, the data that, that um, Elizabeth mentioned? <laughs> oh, but you're muted, too. Oh. Um, so what we found um, in, in our data, we saw patterns of um, the way uh, the patterns of student deaths um, and some were more common in a certain areas, but motor vehicle crashes were number one um, amongst falls. And I think drowning was the third cause of debt for students on study abroad. And, and you know, we think... Um, students have um they're traveling many are traveling for the first time in a foreign country um students are unfamiliar with um the area that they're going to um they are not familiar with um the laws there knowing that it might be different from what we're used to in the united states um, the vehicles, motor vehicle crashes are not, um, is number one. The roadways are not the same. It might not be in the best conditions. The vehicles are not maintained in the same way that it is. Um, poor tires, I mean, we've seen vehicles in our database just roll off a mountain just because they didn't have good maintenance. Um, and so, Having the data that we've collected and looking at the patterns could definitely um, address curriculum planning and um, leader training and make better decisions about the the way we transport our students as in motor vehicle crashes. Greg, I, th I heard something there. It's yeah, it's I'm so sorry. Oh, you you just came through. He just came through. All right. Uh, you know, Ross and Elizabeth are correct. You know, uh, the most common cause of Americans' death overseas is because of the you know motor vehicle accidents. And the takeaway of that is you have to do your own due diligence. Overseas does not have the same OSHA requirements, the same safety and, and, and regulation requirements that we have here in America. So when you go overseas, you have to do your own research, your own due diligence, 
and recognize what some of those pitfalls are. And like Rod was saying, vehicle maintenance is just not the same overseas, particularly in third world countries, as it is in the United States. I mean, vehicles that are allowed on the road there wouldn't even be, you know, able to be licensed in America. So you have those issues where people go overseas and are ex expecting the same security requirements and safety requirements and regulations that they have here, and they just don't exist. So being aware of that is, is half, the, half the answer to that problem, is be, be aware of what is happening in the place that you're going to, and that research is, is on your shoulders. Exactly, and, and Elizabeth, so when, when students uh, study abroad or prepare to study abroad, what sort of training are they provided with, if any? I mean, how are they how are they prepared? And your line is muted, by the way. Yes, um, it really as near as we can tell, it really varies program by program. Uh, some programs that are some universities have very large uh, global education programs, and they usually have a curriculum that might involve many students going in different. Uh, locations with other students together learning about student travel safety. And some of that information is true across the board, but one of the issues about not having good data is you're not getting good location-specific information. So, for example, let's say um, low-income island nations have a much greater risk of uh, drowning deaths than, say, for example, landlocked uh, countries that maybe have a lake or, but, but, but the risks in that country might be completely different. There might be issues with, um, you know, restaurants and drug and drinks being drugged. So that's one of the things about getting the better location specific information, how well that happens, whether the programs, the orientation programs are large or small is very difficult for uh, Roz and I to um, suss that out because we don't have oftentimes access to what's happening at that uh, professional level. What we have is the access that we get through the internet and sometimes through contacts with families about what their experience was. So it's, it, you know, essentially what we're working off of is what we would call anecdotal information. It's yeah. it's not the ideal, but it's something. Well, I mean, are there, you, you, you brought up a great point. I mean, Greg, are there, are there certain locations around the world that are more risky. My, my son is is studying abroad in just three weeks, and he's 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 studying in um in in Scotland. I mean, are there are there greater risks in Scotland versus uh, like an island country like Elizabeth mentioned? Are there what guidance would you provide as far as choosing a destination or a location? I think the department definitely has uh, you know lists. You can go, go to the state department websites, and they give you a, a background in each and every country you want to research on what the threat is there, whether it's terrorist threats, criminal threats, uh, you know, threats of, uh, you know, outbreaks or something like that, uh, severe weather. Again, the, the, the onus is on a person traveling to do the proper research to know what those threats are. And once you know what those threats are, you mitigate those. I mean, a, a, a simple example is, you know, just the locking mechanism on the dormitory or the apartment or the, or the hotel room you're staying in. You know, bring your own locks to make sure that this door is secure because you don't know what kind of locks are going to be provided there. Yeah, you know, again, do your research, do the due diligence to know what the risks are in the particular place that you're going to. Like Elizabeth said, Caribbean island nations, number one threat, drowning. You know, Scotland, with all the rain and the fall that they have, probably motor vehicle accidents on those small roads. So each individual place has its own unique set of risks just be aware of what those risks are and take the appropriate actions to mitigate those risks. Roz. Yeah, so that's a good point, Greg. And, you know, what I found in the aftermath, and I, I still follow the news in Costa Rica, and now I'm learning more than I ever learned prior to my son going. And I thought I did a whole lot of research. But going um, for you, our lucky son is going into to Scotland Go to the local news, the area that he's going to be in, look at the, um, you know, just read the local news. It really does give you a good sense of what's going on on the ground um, and the type, types of things that are happening. And uh, I, I think 
you know, as parents, we could tell our children stay safe. But again, going back to our data, um, without having that information, how do we tell them to stay safe? And what do we tell them not to do and, and what to do to keep themselves safe? And again, we can't stress enough because on our, in our data, we could see that, that there are pa patterns. Unfortunately, we don't have every type of incident happening in every type of country, but we do see the commonalities and say, um, Europe is absolutely gorgeous, but think about it. A young man with a size 11 foot, and we have had that in our database, walking down the steps in, in some of the old buildings and the old architecture wasn't designed for someone who has a size 11 foot. And so we have falls, somebody hit the head and don't survive it. So um, windows, you cannot lean on windows in some parts of the, the country because they're not designed to hold up somebody's weight. So if you lean on windows, you might fall off the windows. Railings, then the safety standards is quite different. Um, one of the girls, um, that you saw in the trailer, um, she actually survived a fall that her friends didn't survive. And it was a fire. There was no fire alarm or fire escape. So just learning about these things could be really life-saving. Yeah, to Greg's point earlier, I mean, you you assume when you travel that, that well, you must have OSHA regulations. You've got to have uh, fire safety and, and fire escapes. And, and, and Greg, so when if there is an emergency, like Ross is talking about, what resources are available to to support students? What where, where does a student get help or assistance? Can they just go to the local embassy and, and uh, seek assistance? Uh, I was the legal the FBI's legal attaché in Budapest, Hungary for three years, and I can assure you that the embassy has no responsibility and no resources available to help you in an emergency. And that's where having a plan comes into place. You have to have plans in place for any critical incident that you may encounter. You're not going to develop a plan in the middle of a crisis. So you need to have those emergency response plans written down, rehearsed, communicated to your parents, communicated to those that travel with you um, so that they're in place. So when you do a critical incident, that you can fall back on those plans. You know, a perfect example is just having a communication plan. You know, you as a traveler overseas should be calling the same person the same time of day, every day of the week, checking in. It could be a simple text. It can be a phone call that says, hey, I'm okay. It's 8 p.m. local time. Don't worry about me. I'll call you tomorrow same time. And you have those check-ins every day. And if you fail to check in on two occasions, then that person you're supposed to be calling now knows to call the authorities. You need to have a duress word or a duress phrase. What I mean by that is if you are under duress, you know, you are kidnapped and have a gun to your head or they're looking to do bad things to you and they allow you a phone call, you need to have a word that you have communicated to your people that if that word is said in a sentence, they know you are under duress. For me and my family, for an example is, if I ever ask about the cat, we don't own a cat, I don't like cats, but if I ever ask about a cat, my family knows that something's not right. So again, prior planning, you gotta have these plans in place. Again, I'll say it again. You're not gonna develop a plan in the middle of a crisis. You have to have those plans in place before travel. Yeah, that, that is, the, those are those are great insights. And, and we, you know, we know that, you know, based on Elizabeth's comments earlier, that most students are not preparing for that. They don't have a communications plan. They're not even thinking about a communications plan or a duress word or things. So, so the question is, how do we scale that out to, to, to educate students uh, studying abroad? How do, how, does, how do those insights, Greg, get to get in the right hands? Any thoughts, anyone? Okay, there we go. That's a great book. <laughs> yep, stay safe. We discussed that. You know, the, the four C's of travel security. Communication plan, we talked about that. Credentials. Mm -hmm. you, need, you need a photograph of your passport, your medical card, your medical insurance card, your driver's license, uh, any prescriptions. You need photographs of that in your phone, but also in the cloud because phones get lost, they get stolen, they fall into the lake. So you need to have access to those important papers, credentials, so you can access them, access them in any internet cafe. So comms plan, credentials. The other one is 
cash. Always have about $200 in cash on you at all times. In the middle of a, let's say, a typhoon or a hurricane or a nationwide protest or a terrorist event, you need to get out of that city right now. Throwing a $100 bill a cab driver can get you to the airport in front of everybody else. So have immediate cash on hand, again, for that emergency. And again, uh, cash, credentials, commons plan, um, and a 4C, excuse me right now. <laughs> but again, it, it's about having those plans in place in the event of an emergency. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, mm -hmm. Roz. Yeah, um, um, good points, uh, Greg. And uh, another thing I, we, we would add is with study abroad, there should be a coordinator. Um, and I, your child should find out who that is, how to contact them, um, a phone number, an email, maybe two people. And then the other thing is, Find out what is the local number to dial 911 yourself if you have to call the police, because it's not the same as the United States on 911. So finding out that information is also key. You're right, Roz. That's the fourth C, contact list. Have that contact list, again, in your phone, but also in the cloud. So you have those important numbers both in country and out of country. You have those numbers available to you, again, that cell phone, we rely on it a lot. It's a great tool to have, but they do get stolen. They do get lost. They do, do get damaged. They do fall in the ocean. So make sure all that information is also in the cloud somewhere that you can access it. Hey, Elizabeth, um, we, we, we talked about this a little bit earlier, but but who, who on a college campus or university uh, campus uh, coordinates and prepares students for uh, studying abroad? If they have an international ed office, it would be somebody in that department. They'll have an orientation program, and they may land um, in an orientation program at their location, too. I know that my son did. I think that Raza's son did with his actual study abroad program. Uh, but it's structured, as near as we can tell, very differently um, from college or university to college and, or in, and university, depending upon the resources that they have. And, and one of the things that I don't think we understood as parents beforehand was that there would be um, so many program options. You, you, you know, you see this with the forums that are held on campus, the information forums that are held on campus. I think that parents often assume that because those programs have been hosted on the campus, that the, the school itself has an idea of that program's on the ground safety. And so it's, it, it's definitely not true to the extent that um, programs that are umbrellaed under the university itself versus the ones that are independent study abroad programs um, are, are sort of assessed to be all the same parents on the losing end of, of uh, this proposition, oftentimes end up very, very surprised because there just aren't necessarily connections. And, and those connections get born not only by families, but by students. Yeah, no doubt. Um, it, um, Elizabeth, it, so uh, we've heard that in the in the injury prevention community, there's an expression, safety manuals are written in blood. Uh, would you mind explaining what that means? Sure. Uh, the whole idea of um, response has generally been built anecdotally. So people who, who are writing safety manuals are oftentimes people who have experienced a really catastrophic outcome, and they learn the hard way. Um, there are really good examples within study abroad, for example, Association for Safe International Road Travel, ACERT. Uh, they, you know, their founder, Rochelle Sobel, lost her son, Aaron, in a bus crash uh, and and really realized that there is an issue with road safety globally and, and built out uh, not only a lot of good information, but an organization that has been around for a, a couple of decades now. Um, Jasmine, Jasmine's Fire Safety Foundation, family lost a daughter 
in a fire. Um, there's an organization that's uh, very focused on methanol safety, another one on hiking safety in the desert so you don't die of hypothermia. Um, and so, yeah, that's how it's born. The idea that people learn from experience. I just want to emphasize that's great and a lot of good, valuable information there. But because bad outcomes are such complex events, you really have to have a lot of good data to be able to separate out all of the factors and how when you have a bad uh outcome building, how you can get sort of layer and layer and layer of variables, really increasing the odds that something catastrophic is going to happen. We don't have that yet. So why don't we have that, Elizabeth? Schools are um, not required to produce transparent uh, safety data. By that, we mean deaths and injuries. And um, for the most part, they don't uh, then i mean it's a choice they don't have to uh, we always tell students when we speak to them and families make sure you ask the program but we're also aware of programs that haven't been truthful uh, so they say we've never had a death and that's sort of the end of the conversation as far as the family is concerned and then sometimes in the aftermath they find out the truth is this is this data uh, covered in the Clery Act? No, uh, Clery is the issues with Clery uh, have to do with the restrictions on geography. So you know the, the idea that property is owned and controlled, and of course you know when a student goes on study abroad, the entire world becomes the student's classroom. So even if even if you were capturing a uh, clery data we'd have so few of our students in a clery database it it just it wouldn't even be meaningful and of course they're restricted in terms of uh, crime reporting and most of our students in our database have passed from uh, unintentional injury so again they wouldn't be in a in a clery data set I mean, Roz, I mean, are there other organizations like Protect Students Abroad but on an international basis that can coordinate this data to, you know, provide resources uh, internationally? Because obviously there, there are uh, study abroad students uh, studying here in the, in the States. I mean, what, what other resources are there? And you're muted, by the way. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So um, that's a good question. But um, I, I think... Um, we're the only ones that's doing this work here in the United States. We've been doing it for over 10 years. Uh, we also, um, although not published, uh, were tracking student debt, uh, international student death and how they travel. And we see the same type of patterns and the way students from other countries studying in, in a different place also get die and injured. It's just the same way that American students, it's happening. And um, it's sadly, um, we haven't come across an organization that's doing the same work that we are doing. It's something that we've thought about um, to expand, um, but it's quite a lot of work. And, you know, just trying to get the the all colleges and universities to be able to say to work with us and and try to collect that data um it, you know we don't want to stop study abroad we've never said close study abroad um my other two children studied abroad and worked abroad um it's about doing it better and we know it can be done better so why not um it's stunning that the higher education community, um, we have the best academic, the best research universities. And here we are, um, don't want to collect the data or, or look at it to make programs safer. And to, you know, all we want is for a child to go, have that experience and come back, come back safely. And that's all that it is. And it's stunning to us that um, it's been hard, uh, 10, 10 years of hard work, and still we have years to go to get to some place. And, uh, you know, the, the, the challenge is, uh, Roz, is, is 
being proactive to prevent something from happening. And Greg knows this very well. You know, it's the the never here, never me uh, mentality. This will never happen to me. It'll never happen here. How do you combat that, Greg? I mean, that, I know that's part of your life's work is is prevention and, and keeping people out of harm's way. How do you combat that 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 most common mindset that we we're all guilty of that? Set and situational awareness. You know, if, if there's one thing that I would recommend, it's for everybody coming overseas, is just learn how to develop good situational awareness. Know who and what's happening and things happening around you where you can avoid potential, you know, danger. Um, you know, take violence for a perfect example. There are what we call pre-incident indicators of violence. In the book, The Gift of Fear, Gavin DeBecker explains that you know, in detail. What are those things that people do that will tell you they are about to exert violence before they do it? So, you know, it, it, again, I've said it before, I'll say it again. The onus is on you to do that research. You know, I, I have three daughters. I would never send my daughters overseas without first making sure they can change the oil in a the car. They can change a flat tire. They have good basic first aid skills because they are going to require themselves to take care of themselves. Nobody's coming to save you. In a critical incident, you have to save yourself. That mindset, that mentality has to be in those individuals prior to traveling. To send a naive individual with no life skills out into a foreign country by themselves it's a recipe for disaster. So parents and the students themselves need to prepare themselves and do some additional training to keep themselves safe. But just have good situational awareness and good survival mindset because, you know, survival is not about the skills. It's not about how fast and quick and strong you are. It's how bad you want to live. So, you know, have those good survival skill sets, you know, learn, you know, learn the, the tricks that bad guys use. One of the biggest Problems they have overseas now is a, a person will get in the back of a taxi cab. That cab driver has been paid off previously. They pull up to a stoplight and two people get into the back of that cab. They put you in the middle and they rob you in the back of that cab at gunpoint or knife point. The cab driver feigns innocence, although he is a part of it. So there's been a lot of injuries and even murders in the backseat of cabs all across the world with that simple you know, technique. So if you're in the back of a cab, make sure the doors are locked. Have a tactical pen in your hand. Track on your Google Maps where you're going to go. You should know exactly where those turns are that the taxi cab driver is going to make before he makes them. If he goes straight and you know you have to turn left, there's going to be a problem. So track the vehicle on your own phone while, he, while you're in the back of that cab. So there's just small tricks like that that can keep you safe. I'm sorry, long-winded answer, but that's my recommendation. No, very insightful, Greg, very insightful. Elizabeth. You know, one thing I wanted to ask you, uh, Greg, is how do you teach situational awareness? It's it's very commonly discussed within, uh, you know, study abroad programs, but I'm wondering what you would say. It's a conscious decision to develop it. It's easy to develop, but it's easy not to do it. So it, it, it basically it's, it's mental laziness and you just have to train yourself. I mean, you really, you can't teach it. You just have to communicate it and get that person to understand by having a situational awareness is going to keep you safer. So it's just changing that mindset that you need to have situational awareness. It's, it's, it's not something you really teach. It's just something that you develop on your own by being aware that you need to develop. Does that make sense? Hey. Oh, you're muted, Elizabeth. Does role playing, does that help a student understand what they need to be doing? Absolutely, Elizabeth. That's a very, very valid point. Role playing is an exceptionally great way to work through critical incidents. Uh, you know, what we do in my family, we play the what if game. What if this happens? What would you do? What if this happens? What would you do? You know, um, so playing those role plays in your mind with someone else 
that develops a plan in your mind. So when you're under stress, when you're under duress, your body will react to the way you thought about it during those scenarios, during that, those thought processes. Again, you're not going to develop a plan in the middle of a crisis. You will freeze in fear. Fear comes from not knowing what to do. So if you develop a plan beforehand, you're not going to freeze in fear. You will respond accordingly. You know, Ross. Yeah. So that's uh, very interesting. And I, I think um, when my son did his orientation, he did it. I think it was an online program that you just have to go through um, and, and get to the end of it. That was the extent of the orientation program prior to him going on study abroad. I think when you talk about role playing and situational awareness, it seems plus our data would make for a good orientation program. But I think we need to do it over the semester prior to the students going so they develop that awareness. Um, you know, when you think of a student, I remember my son applying for the study abroad program. It was during his semester. He had a, a full course load of about 18 credits. And then he was applying and, and doing his essays for the study abroad program, all the forms and all the medical and, and registering. It was quite a lot that he was doing. And I don't know that um, the orientation would have covered that or um, get to the point uh, that he needed to and maybe a semester long orientation as a one credit course might be something that colleges need to think about doing. It's a great idea to have a mandatory course, a semester course that you have to take prior to traveling overseas. I think it's a great idea. You know, I, I alluded to the book earlier, The Gift of Fear by Gavin De Becker. Uh, you know, God gave us humans an advanced early warning system that we will get the hair in the back of our neck will stand up, the hair on our arm will stand up, that gut instinct, women's intuition, call it what you will. But our bodies can pick up on things that are not right. I think Greg froze. We may not, not be able to articulate what's our guts. Well, Greg and is... One uh, of the examples of that okay. is we're by um, a guy. Can you hear me? We, we hear you now. You're, you're frozen up. But um, but yeah, as long as we can hear you, instinct. there we go. Now you're good. You're good now. Just, yeah, trust, trust your gut instincts. Don't, don't dismiss the, that internal uh, fear that bubbles up inside of you because your body will respond to things that you may, may not be able to articulate what causes it, but your body can tell, will tell you when things are not right. Trust your instincts. And I, I love that. That, that, that's a great big idea here is having a mandatory course the semester before you study abroad and, and not not just for studying abroad but for life for a lifetime of safety when traveling abroad because most people are not thinking of those things you, you great you talk about situational awareness you know what the greatest situation awareness is a friend of mine um unfortunately was in a had was majorly burned in a, in a house fire and two-thirds of his body was, was burned and you better believe it. Anytime he goes out for dinner, enters any sort of building, he's looking at every single exit, figuring out where am I, how am I going to exit this building? Because he he, it's a reactive mode. And like we talked about before, most people are not proactive. They're not thinking that this may happen to me, or I might be in the situation. And you said, Greg, it's when when you're in a situation, it's going to be too late. And I think we should advocate for mandatory uh, 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 uh safety uh, pro uh program of course the semester before studying abroad it doesn't have to be you know 15 credit hours or just it could be a, a short course but i think that should be mandatory because it will not only benefit the short term but also a lifetime and, and that's building a culture of safety and that's that's something that we all have to uh to take in um so that that's a that's a great uh Great point. Um, we're going to take some questions from from our participants here. <clears throat> we have a bunch that came in uh, live, and there's a couple that came in um, online. We'll start with the ones that came in um, with the registrations. Uh, let's see here. Uh, da, da, da. So, okay, so Paul uh, Giardino from ICLE asks, if, so what? Uh, he's interested in some discussion on foreign students going to the States for school. Uh, are there similarities and differences 
when when it's when, when this is the study abroad program do you want to try that one greg i think i might be best settled with uh, elizabeth or Roz. Uh, you know coming to the states i think would be a lot safer because we do have a very litigious society which does keep us a little more safer because we have you know requirements and regulations that tend to be a little uh a higher standard which you find overseas so uh again for a foreign student coming to america do the exact same thing we're recommending and that is do your own due diligence do your own research and know where you're going and what's happening what the risks are in those areas you're traveling to that makes sense um Let's see, th this, uh, Elizabeth, do you want to comment on that? Uh, there's another I question. I just wanted to mention that one of the, the concerns that we've heard from the study abroad industry is that students coming here and their families are increasingly uh, concerned about gun violence in America. So that's one big difference that, that I think you could uh, state inbound versus outbound students. Uh, Good point. Roz, did you have a, co a comment? Oh, you're muted. Yeah, sorry. Um, there is one point I wanted to make. Uh, very early on in my research, I found a, a, a government accountability report, a GAO report. It had to do with um, ex exchange students at the time that was coming into the United States and was being placed in in um homes in host homes that wasn't vetted and um uh even some some of the people that students were placed with were pedophiles and all of that but the GAO report stated that while we can um protect the students that come into our country we can't provide the same for our american students traveling abroad so i think that kind of answers uh the question Great, great, great. Um, let's see. Indira asks, uh, what advice would you give a parent about waivers? Does anyone have any th thoughts on that? Elizabeth? The study abroad waivers are really tight uh, as a general rule. I remember when after Thomas was dead and we had a number of lawyers look at the waiver that uh, Tom had signed it, it. There was no way that he was going to be able to read it and understand the implications of what he was signing. And he was over 18. So we didn't see this until he was gone. Um, when, when, you know, when cases rise up, like when a family decides to do something, oftentimes what they uh, seem to find out is that while they're uh, the merits of the case may be strong. The technical hurdles that have been uh, put together are really strong, much stronger than, and so you never even get a, a day in court. And it's, I think that's the purpose of the waivers is to keep the stories out of court. Where, where does this information though get heard? If, if there's no transparent database and you're not hearing about this in the news, where do these stories get heard? Where do the lessons get learned? I, I you know, it's, it's why we keep doing the work we do. No, oh, absolutely. And, and, and I, we, we touched upon this before Elizabeth. I mean, so it, what is there an industry organization for study abroad and what is that group? Yeah, there, there are two main organizations. The first one was NAFSA. It's a Washington, D.C. based organization. It started out addressing the issues around students coming from elsewhere to the United States, so the inbound study abroad students. Um, gradually, they got involved also with uh, outbound students, and as a as a professional membership organization, they have individual members, and they offer uh, coursework for people who are dealing with both ends of the study abroad experience. Um, there's Forum on Education Abroad. They're considered the standard setting body. Uh, they develop best practices. They have conferences every year. It's a, it tends to be a smaller group, and it's very much focused on uh, U.S. students going overseas, not inbound students coming to the U.S. Uh, there's a small group called Pulse, 
uh, and Pulse is uh, safety and security officers who work within the study abroad industry. Um, to the best of my knowledge, it's a U.S.-based group only, and um, they they can, you know, in, in my opinion, I think they can be very good resources. But I also think that they're working with the same deficits that we have. That there's no great transparent database on these events. Very, um, a very important point. Um, we had a couple of folks asking uh, Greg to repeat the four C's. I, mm -hmm. I think this is this is definitely a big key takeaway. And yes. uh, would you mind repeating that, Greg, please? Always have cash on hand. I recommend $200 in the 20s. Always have cash on hand. Have your contact list, both numbers of people who are local to where you're studying and back home. Have your contact list, not only in your cell phone, but also in the cloud. Communication plan. OK, have a time of day every day where you call in and check in and have that duress word, or that duress phrase available. And then the last one would be uh, contact list, cash, communication plan. And Ross got the last one, right? Credentials. Last credentials. One yeah. Make sure you have uh, you know um, pictures of your passport, your driver's license, your prescriptions, your medical insurance card, you know, all that kind of stuff. Make sure that's in your phone, but also make sure it's available in the cloud as well. Excellent. Thank you. The, the big, big key takeaway. Um, so we have another question here as well um, uh, regarding the the um, the role of drugs and alcohol when it comes to injuries and deaths with students uh, studying abroad. Does anyone want to take that? Is there anything in the database, Roz, regarding uh, drugs and alcohol? Is that has that been documented? Yeah, we do see some of that in our in our database. Um, you know, uh, when a student dies, a lot of times, if it if it involves alcohol or drugs, it's t the, we find that um, right away the student is blamed for the incident, and we've learned a like in the in the trailer that you saw, the dad saying um, his son was drugged, and that is a real student who died on study abroad in Italy, um, that dad had the, uh, you know, the wherewithal to be able to hire a private investigator to find out what happened. But when it did happen, it was sprawled all over the news that he drank himself drunk and walked himself on a train. So um, it, right away, the student is blamed. And, and we do see some of those incidences um, that involved alcohol, we do know in some of the cases that that wasn't the actual cause of what, uh, how the student died. Um, so drugs and alcohol, yeah, um, the drugging, the date rape drug in the alcohol, yeah, it's something that we do see regularly. Elizabeth. There's no doubt uh, drugs and alcohol are not going to improve your safety. They they are a risk. They diminish as as Greg has been speaking about. You know, becoming self aware. They diminish awareness. Um, for us, in terms of our own research, to get at reliable numbers around drugs and alcohol, we're so dependent upon new sources that I don't know that we could comment on the um, the the rates of of alcohol or drugs as a contributing factor uh we but we but we can tell that it doesn't help your situation we take one last question oh, go ahead greg keep in, that, yeah, keep in mind that the drinking age in most places other than the united states is 18 years old so you have these college kids going overseas and they're able to legally drink and they're not used to it and that definitely is a contributing factor and as we've talked about, too, the host country is always going to look for excuses not to be blamed. So even the smallest traces of alcohol, when you do that toxicity scan, uh, the testing, any any amount of alcohol, the headlines are going to read, there was alcohol in his bloodstream. They might, it could have been just a drop of it, but if it's in there, they're going to run with that story and make it look like it was that, you know, it was the alcohol's fault and not the host country's fault. Man, that is that no, that very very important point. Yeah, we, we often overlook at that from you know from our you know U.S. centric point of view. But yes, other countries have a very different culture, different laws, different regulations. 
Um, we so we ran out of time, but here's here's the deal. We're gonna just quickly go around, uh, and, and I'm just gonna ask for final thoughts, words of wisdom uh, that you would give my son or any student or parent uh, who has a has a child uh, traveling studying abroad. Um, but I just want to remind our participants. So we we have way more questions than we had time to answer. So we're gonna continue this conversation in the Zero Now community. Uh, if you go to zeronow.org, click on community. Uh, we'll post the questions in there. The um, our panelists will after this. Please join. Uh, hop in there for for you know for uh, in the, the next twenty four hours to check the the questions. Uh, the replay of this webinar will be available in that same location. So we'll continue this conversation. If you have additional questions, please um, please ask that in the community. So final words of wisdom, final thoughts for a student or for parents of students uh, um, studying abroad. Roz, we'll start with you. Sure. Um, thank you all for joining us. And I, the first thing I would say is uh, please uh, visit uh, Protect Students Abroad website. Um, it, it was written from the parent perspective. Um, Elizabeth is also a writer and awesome researcher who's done amazing work with the website that aims to inform and educate students and parents. It gives you a lot of um things to think about and uh, formula questions to the study abroad program. Um, our contact information is on there and please feel free to reach out. I will leave you with the words um, by Einstein. It says, uh, Einstein quotes, quote said, those who have the privilege to know have the duty to act. I say, I unfortunately have the privilege to know. It is why I do the work I do now, and so I act. And I asked you to, if you're at a, with a college, um, take it back to your college and reach out to us. We're willing to work with you. That 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 is that that is uh, uh, amazing, Roz. And and I think it goes back to I think we need to we after this we need to talk about advocating for mandatory uh, a course the semester before studying abroad. Uh, I think that just needs to be a standard. Um, there's no two ways about it. Uh, Elizabeth, final uh, thoughts and words of wisdom for, um, someone considering or traveling or studying abroad. Uh, I, first of all, one bit of good news, uh, last year, SUNY's, um, 64 campus program, uh, uh, has agreed to give transparent safety data uh, on their website. And we're really happy to have worked with them over a, quite a number of years and with the support of the New York State Governor's Office. So that's been a real win for us. But in terms of other ways to get at better safety information, what I would say to students is they have the data. They know what happens when they go on their trips. And a lot of times what we hear from students is that they're concerned about coming home and reporting things. They're worried about it hurting their grades or their ability to get credit, or maybe they were unhappy with their program and they would like to have some of, some of their costs rebated. Um, and, it, and it sort of stifles the reporting, but I really want to encourage students, you see something, you experience something, you say something. That's the start of a database. And it could be really powerful if we get students proactively reporting difficult outcomes, not to get people into trouble, but to just make study abroad safer. So we're building a culture of safety and it starts with the individual. Absolutely, Elizabeth. Mr. Schaefer, final, final thoughts or words of wisdom. everybody to travel and see as much of it as possible. But no matter where you travel to, there are inherent risks. Before you travel, do your due diligence, do your research, learn from these horrible life lessons that both Roz and Elizabeth went through. Use those as examples of, of, of dangers and, and, and risks. But it's up to you to save yourself. It's up to you to do the research. Nobody's coming to save you. So be safe out there, but do the research to learn how to be safe. Thanks, Greg. Thank you, Elizabeth and, and Roz, and uh, really appreciate your insights. And um, this was very, very helpful. And we want to make sure that this 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 program gets in front of many 
uh, educators, students, parents as possible, and, and we start changing this whole dynamic. Uh, just a reminder, go to the community uh, to continue this conversation. Our next conversation is uh, Tuesday, September 19th, and we're discussing preventing harm with gun detection technology. So um, we're covering all aspects of, of safety, and this one is, I think, is very timely given, um, you know, given the, the fall semester coming up, and we really appreciate your insights. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today, and uh, stay safe. We'll, we'll see you in the community after this and answer some more questions. Take care. Thank you. <laughs>